Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years. This is our weekly Space Bites news segment where I cover all of the breaking news in space and astronomy that we're covering on Universe Today. Now, I write a weekly email newsletter that goes out to 50,000 people and it's magazine size gigantic, but I understand not all of you want to be able to read some of you want to have the news videoed at you. And so that's what we're doing here. But if you do want to read the newsletter, go to universe today.com slash newsletter and sign up. All right, let's get into the news. On May 12th, the event horizon telescope is going to release some groundbreaking news about the Milky Way. So we all got a press release from the European Southern Observatory this week that the Event Horizon Telescope was going to announce some groundbreaking news about the Milky Way on May 12th. But not what it is. Now, it could be anything, but it's the Event Horizon Telescope and it's the Milky Way. And so Several years ago, the Event Horizon Telescope, this worldwide network of telescopes, captured an image of the supermassive black hole at the heart of galaxy M87 and the heart of the Milky Way. And within a couple of years, they released the image of M87, but we're still waiting for the picture of the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. And why did it go that way? Why didn't we get the one that's closer and, and more relevant to us? And that's because the one at M87 is really big. And the changes to this giant event horizon around the supermassive black hole are unfolding very slowly. While the one at the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, it's smaller, closer, and a lot more dynamic. And when I talked to astronomers, they said that it's much more difficult to run the calculations, pull the information out of the one at the Milky Way than M87. And so that's the one they released first, but they've been crunching away. And so Maybe, hopefully, probably, um, we'll see this, finally see this image of the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. But they haven't confirmed that that's what it's going to be. So May 12th could show up and I could be completely wrong. So don't yell at me if it's not true. Webb has almost reached its final coldest temperature. More Webb news. The James Webb Space Telescope is continuing to cool down and cool down. Remember that when Webb was built, it was at room temperature, and then it was moved down to South America, and it became the temperature of the launch complex at Kauru. And then it's been spending several months in space, slowly cooling down with its sun shield to try to cool down the instruments. The main instruments, essentially the telescope and all of the secondary mirror, primary mirror are just a few dozen degrees above absolute zero. So the secondary mirror is at 29.4 Kelvin. The primary mirror is between 34.4 and 54.5 Kelvin. And one specific instrument, Miri, has been cooled down using a cryo cooler down to seven Kelvin. So these are all very cold temperatures. And it's almost cold enough to do all of its science operations. The engineers using web said they'd like to bring it down another 0.5 to 2 Kelvin across the board to get the telescope into its final final coldest state. And this should happen fairly naturally over the coming months. Prepare yourself new engineering images from James Webb will blow your mind. This was a surprise. I was not expecting to see this. We got a series of images that came from Webb showing a random star field in the various instruments that are attached to Webb. And you can look at them and they all look pretty great. You know, they've stars. And if you look closer, there's definitely some galaxies back there. But it's really hard to compare this. In a recent question show, someone asked me like, what's the first thing that we're going to see from James Webb? And I said, we're probably going to see something that is a comparison of images that were taken by Herschel and Spitzer in the past, just so we can get a comparison of how good Webb is compared to them. And we got that kind of by accident. So one of the regions that was taken with Miri, which is that coldest instrument, is a region that had actually already been taken by Spitzer and Herschel over the last couple of years. And you can get this comparison of what goes from fairly blobby fuzzy region to this just incredibly pristine, finely focused nebulosity. It's really incredible. So a big thanks to Anders Gaspar who 
caught this and aligned all these various images and share this out on Twitter. And I think this fulfills what I was suggesting. Now we get a really nice comparison of web versus the previous instruments that have come before. The engineers working with web are quite excited. They say that the capability, the focus of web meets their expectations, exceeds their expectations, and everything is kind of ready to go. And so now we're just uh, probably less than a month, I would say, from starting to see some first images, but but stay tuned, they'll they'll happen when they happen. I did an interview with Nobel Laureate John uh, Mather a couple of months ago talking about what we might see with web all the work that's gone into it over time. So if you're interested in that definitely check out this interview. Eight missions are getting extensions. Most exciting Osiris Rex is going to asteroid Apophis. Every few years, NASA looks at all of the missions that are actively working and the ones that are still functioning, they decide whether or not to give these missions some kind of mission extension. In other words, they're going to have funding maintenance funding for the team that's running the mission, the science operations, the hard drives, the servers, the websites, the access to the communication systems and so on. Obviously, it's a lot less money than sending the mission in the first place, but it still costs money. And so NASA has to decide what they're going to do. In other cases, they'll actually repurpose the missions to give them some new target. And so NASA just announced this week that they've gone and given eight of their missions, missions extensions. Now a lot of them are have had many mission extensions in the past, you've got curiosity, you've got uh, the Mars reconnaissance orbiter, you've got the lunar reconnaissance orbiter, you've got a bunch of these missions that are have been going for in some cases decades, continuing to work in perfect operation, so they'll be able to keep on doing their science. But one really interesting mission extension is the Osiris Rex mission, which did its sample return from asteroid Bennu, it's gathered the sample, it's returning the sample back to Earth. And once it releases its sample capsule, it's going to fly off and visit asteroid Apophis. And Apophis, you might recognize that well, maybe you've been watching too much Stargate. But Apophis is this asteroid that is quite well known for making close flybys of Earth. And for the longest time, it was considered one of the most dangerous asteroids. In the next few decades, it was going to make a very close flyby of Earth, like within the orbit of Earth's geosynchronous satellites. And then the changes from that orbit may cause it to crash in the future. At this point, astronomers have have ruled that out Apophis is no threat, but it's a big asteroid, and it's going to come very close to the Earth. And it's a really great opportunity to learn a lot about how near Earth asteroids interact with the Earth, what they're made of and so on. And so now it looks like Osiris Rex, after delivering its sample is going to be off to Apophis to do more research and analysis on this quite interesting potentially dangerous asteroid. And that's a really exciting. It's a doubling of the science that we're going to be getting from Osiris Rex. So so good news. NASA is ready to try and fix Lucy's unlatched solar panel. The Lucy spacecraft launched about a year ago. And it's going to be it's, it's a really cool mission that's going to go out to Jupiter's Trojan belts and see almost 10 different asteroids across the two Trojan regions as well as the asteroid belt. Some of these objects have moons of their own, some even have more moons of their own. So it's a chance for one mission to see a lot of separate different images and give astronomers like a really good survey of the kinds of objects that are located in the Trojan regions around Jupiter. And after the mission launched one of its solar panels fully unfurled and latched. But the other one, if you sort of imagine it's like this circle, where the solar panels has this this string that pulls the solar panels out into the circle, and it didn't get all of the way around. And the solar panel array hasn't latched onto the spacecraft. Now it's not a big problem if it was just coasting, and it would still be able to gather harvest solar energy from the sun into the solar panel. You know, it's um, 
345 degrees, not 360 degrees. So it's it's probably fine. But the problem is that it's not latched. And so when the spacecraft does some kind of burn to do an orbital correction, the solar panel has the chance of flapping against the side of the spacecraft. And so NASA really wants to get that thing latched. They've been working on the problem, they think they've got a solution. And now in the next few weeks, they're going to try and implement the solution, get it fully for unfurled and latched against the spacecraft so that then it's safe for them to do their orbital maneuvers as they continue on with their mission. The FAA delays the Boca Chica decision to May 31st. I'm not sure if you were keeping track of this. Well, maybe people on the SpaceX channels were but um, but we there was a possibility that SpaceX was going to receive approval from the FAA to launch Starship as early as the end of April that date came and now we got an announcement that the actual final approval could come May 31st. So now we're still about a month away from Starship's earliest potential launch date. And that's probably fine. Because it doesn't look like Starship is completely ready to go. We saw some leaked images this week of a collapsed internal plumbing system on booster number seven. So it's probably not going to be able to fly They're probably gonna have to use booster eight. We saw some up more updates of the Raptors. So it looks like SpaceX is still hustling to get the booster the super heavy booster and Starship stack ready to fly. And so now the date that we're kind of targeting is going to be May 31st as the possible earliest date. And I think that's fine. You know, Musk knows that we're trying to get to a 1000 patrons here on universe today. And so he's scared. He thinks that we might beat him. But definitely. Um, we'll see what happens. Speaking of the race between us and Elon Musk, uh, we are just close to 900 patrons on university and we are in a race with the space launch system and SpaceX Starship to see who will win. Will we reach a 1000 patrons? Or will SpaceX launch or will SLS launch who's going to be first and the way you can participate in that, of course, is to become a patron of what we do on universe today. Now you're not just paying me, of course, you're helping to contribute to the salaries of more than a dozen writers on universe today. Chad, who does all of our video editing for the QAs, Anton, who's doing a lot of the production and and editing for these news segments, we've got a big team, a lot of mouths to feed, and you can help us get there. So go to patreon.com slash universe today, help us hit 1000 patrons before Starship or SLS reach space. Thank you. Sophia Observatory will officially end on September 30th. Now this is fairly recent. Um, I did an interview with Dr. Margaret Meixner a couple of weeks ago about the Sophia telescope. And we talked all about the amazing science, the long history, this incredible collaboration between NASA and the German Space Agency. And then this week, we learned that they're going to be ending the mission. But they've had over 800 flights done some incredible science. And it's one of the most exciting concepts that has been released in space and astronomy, an infrared observatory flying on an airplane flying at high altitude gathering data. But we're going to be seeing the end of the mission on September 30th. So just a couple more months to go and then Sophia will end. But if you watch the interview, I offered a bunch of suggestions to Dr. Meixner. And so who knows, maybe we'll see some future version of a infrared telescope in the back of a super guppy or a interferometer on the back of a 747. Who knows? Who knows? But again, thanks, Sophia, for all the work. And uh, hopefully all of the scientists will continue to work through that data for decades to come. Two weeks ago, we shared pictures that Perseverance took of its own back shell and parachute crashed onto the surface of Mars. And we said that maybe Perseverance is going to get a little closer. But NASA got really creative and they sent Ingenuity the helicopter to go and image the crash site up close. It was a total surprise. I can't believe that they did that that they were able to task ingenuity to send it over there take these images. It looks like a UFO crashed on the surface of Mars, you can see just the damage that it took going well over 100 kilometers per hour as it hit the surface of Mars, you can see the cables leading to the parachute. 
it's really an amazing image. And it just shows the power and capability of having a helicopter on the surface of Mars to serve as a scout with future missions. I, I can't imagine that we're ever going to see a mission to Mars that doesn't have one of these helicopters assigned to it as well. Really incredible. We got a cool video from SpaceX of the crew for mission approaching the International Space Station, you can see the rockets firing as it's getting closer and closer to the space station. And it was amazing, again, sort of this modern age where you've got these cameras attached to both the rockets, to the capsules, to the station from the ground. And so we're now this age where if you have any questions, or you want to see what's happening over the course of a mission, you can. And this just is an, another amazing example of that. And finally, we got this great image of Ganymede casting a shadow on the surface of Jupiter. And last week, we talked about an eclipse on the surface of Mars seen by Perseverance. And in this case, we're watching an eclipse go on the surface of Jupiter from the Juno spacecraft. I mean, it's not really an eclipse. The technical term for this is a transit. And if you ever image Jupiter, you can see the shadows of the moons crossing in front of Jupiter all the time. It happens quite regularly. But still to see it from this perspective is quite impressive. And it looks very similar to an image from the movie 2010 when we make contact. And so I, I love this, how science is matching fiction, science fiction in this case, it's a pretty cool picture. All right, those are all the top space and astronomy news stories that we wanted to cover this week. Uh, if you want to go deeper into anything that we're doing, you definitely want to sign up to the weekly email newsletter that I write every week, go to universetoday.com slash newsletter, or just come to universe today and read all of the stories that we're posting. This is just a fraction of what we're covering on universe today. If you prefer to have an audio version, you should sign up to my podcast, go to universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for universe today in iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and support us on Patreon, help us reach that 1000 subscribers before SLS launch or SpaceX launch. And we will see all of you next week. Thanks, everyone.